Welcome, welcome back. Another episode of the Hawk Vision Podcast. I am your host, Chuck Hawkins, here to help you shorten the learning curve on your way to greatness. Make sure that you like, share, and subscribe across all of your social media platforms, especially here at YouTube. Uh, More importantly, share this podcast with other visionaries just like you, because this second season, as you already know, this lineup of guests is just getting bigger, stronger, like they, I can't even tell you all the heavy hitters that are coming. The information that you'll be able to hear and learn from will absolutely change your life if you allow it to. Um, This week's guest is someone that I've known for years online and have been watching her grow her brand from a a mere idea to one of the most consistently influential media brands online. She's been able to build out an absolute empire by teaching entrepreneurs how to uh, build platforms that attract attention and multiply their exposure online. She has an online community that is several tens of thousands strong. Uh, More importantly, they're actively engaged, right? So she's a four-time author, a heavy hitter business consultant, a speaker, so much more. Most importantly, she's this week's visionary, Charvette Mitchell. Welcome to the show. Oh my goodness. Thank you for having me. I'm just going to take you around and do my intro like all this stuff. <laughs> that is Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. You know, I'm a fan of edification and you have earned every single one of those. Like that's the best part is that people can Google it and it's all true. Thank you. Because there's a lot of smoking mirrors out here, right? Ooh, you ain't never lied. Right now it's, it's smoking, smoking mirror season. You know what I mean? Yeah. Especially yeah. in the social media streets. Um, Let's, I, before we jump in, I have to ask, because the people need to know what type of woman they're dealing with right now. All right. Okay. Crock okay. pot or air fryer? Ooh, this is <laughs> torn. I am torn. I am going to say air fryer. You're going to say air fryer over the crock pot. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I love it. I, I don't have a specific answer. I'm, I'm 50-50. Um, okay. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm air fryer. Okay. <laughs> if you had asked me like six months ago, it would have been crock pot, but I got an air fryer for Christmas. So that mm-hmm. changed the game. Yeah. Changed your life a little bit. You can do the fries and the shrimp and the, and the chicken, everything, you know. Egg rolls. Egg. Yeah. <laughs> Tater tots. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, so let's jump right in. What's the difference? When do you know you have a brand versus just having a business? Oh, recognition. Recognition um, is one of the things. If we think about like McDonald's and and I say this all the time, um, you know, you can have a child that's three years old who cannot read and cannot write. But if you drive down that road in whatever city and they see those golden arches uh, and they start screaming and having a panic attack because you won't stop and get the nuggets and the fries. That's recognition. That's brand recognition. So really the brand is when you have that um, across a lot of different platforms, recognition. And that people know when they see your logo, they see your colors, they see something that you produce, they connect it with you. It's the recognition. I love it. And I I knew that I had to leave with that question because you're teaching people how to scale both, right? So it's one thing to have a business. It's another to have a brand. And a lot of people think once you have the brand, the work is finished, right? Like oh, now yeah. you can just relax on the brand, you know, the brand name for entrepreneurs. What do you say to that? Um, it is a constant work. It is a constant work. And, and if we go back to the McDonald's commercial, whose McDonald's has been out forever, their, their menu hasn't, they have some changes, but they have some staples, but McDonald's will show you the same commercial uh, three times in a 30 minute sitcom years later, and they are already already widely known. So if a big brand like McDonald's is constantly branding and marketing, we as entrepreneurs, small business owners, we are not off the hook either. Mm, I love it. I love it. And you know what I thought about more as, as part of that is McDonald's system, right? And we're going to talk yeah. about this a little bit later, but they have a significantly uh, duplicatable system. Anytime you go into McDonald's, the fries are on the left, right? And so yeah. they, they had you doing the same thing over and over. I love that you were able to, uh, to paint it like that. Um, tell the listeners, because you've been in, uh, in the game for a minute, right? And, and you've seen trends come and go. You've seen things, you know, take off and things fizzle out. When did you decide to take your business seriously? Was it the first good check? Was it the recognition as an entrepreneur, the vision? When did you decide to take it seriously? 
You know what? I um, spent a, a lot of years in corporate America. So I spent 25 years in corporate America and I was building on the side and okay. I was comfortable. Um, the position that I was in um, before COVID and all of that, I was working from home, mobile worker. Uh, you know, you had your back then BlackBerry and then switched to iPhone and your laptop and you could work anywhere. So they actually prepared me for entrepreneurship, but I was comfortable. I was very comfortable doing kind of my thing on the side um, and then working full time. And then there became a point, and I would say once I'd hosted probably my third conference, um, my second, let me say, no, my second conference, um, I begin to feel in a box and I begin to question myself and say, okay, I'm, I'm here sitting at this company. And at that point, um, you know, 23 years, 24 years had gone by. What would it look like? What could it look like if I threw all of myself into Mitchell Productions? And I basically just didn't want to have any regrets. So once I got to that place of what could this look like, even if it didn't work, Chuck, even if this didn't work, I didn't want to look back and say, I never tried. I never stepped out there. Um, and so it was really that moment of, I don't want to have any regrets. So let me see how to make this happen. And I made it happen. That's a level of conquering fear that most people don't reach, right? Because most people are more scared of failing than not trying. And yours mm -hmm. is the other way around. Are you, do you remember the process enough to talk about how you dealt with that mentally, especially being that you were already comfortable? Because comfort, comfortability, <laughs> is that a word? Comfortability? I don't yeah. Know. But that <laughs> it's going to make it one today. Yeah, it's going to be a word today. Um, <laughs> but comfortability, like it, it kills greatness, right? So how did yeah. you, how did you figure that part out? You know, I read an article um, about a survey that people did asking people about their regrets. And they asked a group of 20 somethings, what do you regret? And the 20 somethings started regretting, uh, you know, that night I went to that party and I messed up, or that class I failed, or that that terrible boyfriend or girlfriend I was with. So they started naming the things that they had done. Right. When they did the same survey with a group of 50 plus, 60 plus, they started naming the things they did not do. I didn't start the business. Mm -hmm. I didn't write the book. I didn't reconcile that relationship. And so that made me think, you know, as we get towards the end, as we move on in life, not towards the end, as we move on in life, we the regrets are around what we didn't do. And so that's what that's what it was about. And now I will say, you know, I've been at, been at the company for 25 years. Um, you know, I didn't have a ton of debt. I didn't have, you know, I had worked on, I was living modestly. Um, and so those things, my credit was good. So those, some of those foundational things were in place versus just saying, I'm jumping out and I'm going to just do this willy nilly. But I looked at, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, and I'm a very stable person. Most entrepreneurs are risk takers. Yes. Um, my, you know, lived in the same condo for several years, worked at the same, <laughs> I had the same phone number since, you know, people just, some people change oh their phone God. numbers. Like I have never changed my phone. cell phone number. Like, like my phone number has been the same since 2000. Like, so I'm a very stable person. So it's yeah. almost kind of contradictory um, that I jumped into entrepreneurship, but it was that thought process of, okay, I'm at this point in life, um, I'm good to at least try. Right. Worst case scenario, I'll go get another, I'll go get a job. And matter of fact, where I left, they say, you probably could come back here, you know, if it didn't work out. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Wow. So, and it wasn't fatal. That's the other thing that if, if it didn't work, it wasn't going to be a fatal situation. So. Oh my God. This is turning into a mindset episode because yeah. I think that that's the perfect way to articulate how people feel like failure is, right? Because mm -hmm. what do they tell you when you start your business you, or, or even, you know, to grow your business, you have to have a list, right? You have to have your email list. You have to have your contact list and tell people that you're in business. And so when you fail, Right now, it feels like everybody's watching the spotlights on you and you have been the one that failed. Nobody else has ever failed before. You're the only right. person to ever launch and fail. And now everybody's watching you and laughing at you. Um, or so you think. 
or, or so you think. Yeah. So let me stick a pin there because I actually talk about this in my first book collaboration, um, Propel. So available on Amazon, um, and I talk about hosting my first kind of in-person event. Yeah. And you know, at that point, I had the radio show, which you you know you were the podcast, the Charvette Mental Radio Show has been in these yes. streets like thirteen years. So you know, at that point, it was probably five or six years old. I had interviewed all kinds of people. Felt like my media exposure was good, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna host this event I don't even want that many people like maybe 10 people it was $150 for the ticket and two people signed up I had rented a hotel room I had all and two people came and so the whole time I was concerned about I'm Charvette Mitchell only two people signed up what am I going to say when people say well how was your event do you have photography do you have videos do you have what am and I was so concerned about what people would say and let me tell you what happened nobody asked me a mumbling word nobody <laughs> asked me anything are you serious about the, a lot of times the fear of what we think the failure that we think people are going to be laughing and talking we are kind of talking that up in our head and that is a real live story my first event two people showed up two people I did not know and wow. um I thought oh my god what are people going to say and no nobody asked me anything I still, that's, nobody that's, said. that's better than two people that you know though right that's better two people that you don't know is better than two people that you don't know yes and i wish i had thought about it that way then <laughs> yeah i wish i had thought about it that way then so learn from learn from some from, from my uh, mistake so you have helped countless entrepreneurs uh launch and help to brand and build websites and really create their own communities how do you approach or feel about the market saturation thought process, right? A lot of people feel like they can't launch because somebody else is already successful and doing it and nobody's gonna, pay. like, how do you deal with that part? The market's too saturated. Um, there is enough pie for everyone. There is enough pie that everybody can get a slice. So that's my first thought, first thought process. And yeah. there are people that, that will hear your voice even if it's the same, you know, people talk about all the different types of bread, you know, that's in the grocery store and you walk down the aisle, you know, what if one bread company said, well, I'm not going to put out our version of whatever, because somebody else already has it out. There is somebody that will be attracted to your message, your voice, your story, your brand, um, that even if somebody is doing the exact same thing, there are people that will be attracted to you. So from a saturation standpoint, there is enough pie for everyone. There really is. If we open and think like from an abundance standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of one of my mentors, uh, Holton Bugs used to say he wanted 1%. This is back when we were doing network marketing, which I think I've got 90% of my success principles from, uh, but he used to say, I want 1% of the coffee market. I don't care what everybody else is drinking. I want 1%. That'll make me a billionaire. And he got there. You know what I mean? So it was, I think perspective is, is the hard part for us to wrap our heads around. You know what I mean? In terms yeah, of what yeah. because we always feel when like it's saturated. Absolutely. And when I was um, creating web design, which I've actually phased out of that service, yes. but, you know, people say, oh, you know, there's so many web designers, but the small business administration put out a report that said 49% of small businesses don't have a website. So wow. even if for those that are, are creatives and saying, oh, so many designers, there's so many they're like 50% of the small business that still don't have a website. So that proves, even if you feel like a market is saturated, there's still a lot of a market available for you. Wow. Talk to me about yeah. the, the, the platform builder system. I, I believe there's six parts. Yeah. So I have a six part framework um, that I use. And um, that is really the basis of how I help um, service based primarily service based entrepreneurs, um, females, typically a few lucky men get sprinkled in <laughs> um, but <laughs> to, to build their platform. And if we think about a platform, I'd love for, you know, the listeners, viewers to think about a stage okay. and um, typically in a, an arena or somewhere that there is a, a platform or a stage. The purpose is to raise the vis- visibility so that the person in the back, the person on the side can see them. And so my six-part framework, um, I offer, um, walk people through in one-on-one consulting and group coaching is, so the first parts that we start with, number one is really around your products and services. Okay. You would be surprised um, the amount of people who are, oh, I'm, I'm a speaker, I'm this, I'm that. And then when you sit down and talk to them, it's like, okay, well, what is it that you offer? 
there are people that get stomped. I don't know. Have you ever experienced that? Or absolutely, I don't know. I, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And, and so I, my, it's even worse for me because I I end up with clients that think they're speakers and are mm. really just coaches, right? Oh wow. And I have yeah. you know some, and that was a distinction that I have to do for myself a long time ago, right? Is is some think they're speakers and they're really coaches, and some are coaches or are operating as coaches when they should be speakers, you know? And I think, yeah. you know, there's tons of different ways that that could go, but I, I've definitely seen it. Yeah. So that's where the framework starts is getting really, getting people really clear. What is it that you're offering um, and looking at their pricing? Are, are you, you know, where's, where's your pricing and then who are you offering that to? So in, in making sure they're really focused on their ideal client and their ideal, their avatar, as people say. So that's kind of yeah, the first part of the, yeah. <laughs> the um, and then the avatar. Yeah. Um, so who do you yeah. want to ideally work with? Um, okay. But really getting really clear on what are you offering? And sometimes that shifts for people. Um, you know, our, our businesses and our brands are living things. So yeah. as we grow yeah. and as we gain more, um, there may be some shifts. So that's the first place. And the second thing that I deal with um, is visual branding. So how do you look? Once, okay, you got a product and a service, you're going to be putting it out there, you're trying to attract your ideal client, when they come to your website, when they go to see you on social media, when they see you on YouTube, what do they see? Is it cohesive? Does it look professional? Are you using simple things as consistent colors? Like the logo, the, everything should be consistent. No matter where they pop around, if they're on your email list, if they come in your store, if they get your packaging, all of it should be consistent. So we deal with the visual branding second. Okay. Well, and step three, let's run through them. Yeah. Oh, we're going to run through them. Okay, great. So yeah. step three or the third part of the framework is around content marketing. So we know what you're offering. We know who you're offering it to. Visually, you're going to look good. Now you've got to start marketing and content marketing is king. Yeah. And so that includes social media marketing. That includes YouTube video live streaming. That includes email marketing. You might be doing text message marketing. And so anywhere where you're the, the voice and the message of your brand, you might be doing Instagram reels. Yes. The voice and the message of your brand and the content you're putting out blogging, that's all in that content marketing piece. And then um, we move over to the fourth part of the platform builder framework, which is around speaking. Yes. Um, and so we, we've talked a little bit about speaking, but really every entrepreneur, i.e. expert, should look for speaking opportunities because it simply gets you in front of an audience that you didn't have to pay for and you did not have to build. Um, and so looking for speaking opportunities or creating speaking opportunities. So sometimes people will say, well, nobody knows me. Nobody is asking me to speak. If right. you jump on Facebook Live, you just created a speaking opportunity. If you jump on Twitter, uh, on video, you just create or YouTube or whatever, you just yes. created your own speaking opportunity. So speaking positions you as a leader and I um, work with people on, OK, let's let's work on that. Then number five is around events. So if you're establishing your platform and personal brand, you should be looking at hosting your own events. That could be small, that could be meetups, that could be virtual webinars, summits, that could be in-person conferences. I happen to do conferences. And so you should be looking for um, events, which also is kind of tied really closely to the speaking because then you can speak at your own events, um, which is kind of that creating a speaking yes. piece. But then you also can really leverage other people's events. So even if you are not hosting your own events, what are other events you can go to and show up as and network at, and that helps build your brand. And then um, the sixth component is around media, looking for media opportunities, um, such as podcasts. This is a media opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, and any major media, major media, new media, you know, all of the different media outlets that are out there, TV, radio. And again, that can be traditional or that can be new, what we call new media, looking for those opportunities or turning into media. So starting your own podcast. Yeah. So that um, those are the six uh, pieces of uh, my framework on um, the Platform Builder Program that will build, help build and elevate your, your brand and the visibility of what you have to offer so that you generate more revenue. And that's what it's all about. I love how inclusive uh, those six steps are. Each one plays off of each other. I want to go back to number three because yeah. we, we have a talk um, in, in our industry, business in general, there's this never ending battle to come up with content as well as a marketing strategy for that content. 
Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the tools that you use to help make that easier? I know everybody hears about Canva and we have Buffer Auto Post. What does Charvette use, Secret Sauce, to help get it out there, you know, once you have the strategy in mind? Um, so I do a couple things. So for Facebook, um, I'll use their pre-schedule feature in my Facebook group okay. um, that is done there. I also am using um, on and doing some actual organic posts. Like, so even though I know what I'm posting, because on the personal page, I'm a, I am a fan, which is an argument in the industry of you, of utilizing your personal page as well as your business page. Yes. And the personal page yes. does not have a auto posting. So there's some organic posting there, but I spend most of my time in my Facebook group, which I can use the Facebook schedule feature there for Instagram. It's Planoli, P-L-A-N-O-L-Y.com. Okay. I believe I spelled that right. Planoli, which allows you to um, pre-schedule and um, put your post, you know, put things in and get them scheduled and they pop up on the app and you post them. So those are my main, main things um, that I'm using. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I the reason that I wanted to ask is because I, I, I get tons of questions about different apps and I know there's Affy and Planoli, like you mentioned, there's Buffer Auto Post and they all have like different features. I think one even, one or two of them even tell you what's the best quote unquote time that you should post your, your various yeah. content. So. Yeah, there are a lot. Some have a repeat feature, um, which is great, you know, where it can, you can have evergreen content where, you know, every Tuesday, I want to invite people to a consultation and that post shows up every Tuesday. So um, if people are looking, I would, that would be something that I would look for. You know, you, you can get into this battle of what's better. Was it at this point, pick, a, pick a tool is the main <laughs> if you're procrastinating on what is better, pick a tool. Um, but one thing I would look for is if there is a repeat um, feature. Uh, that is a, a feature that I think is really beneficial. Absolutely. A repeat feature and a free version, right? If you just, if you just <laughs> test and getting started. You know, right, you right. And right. then upgrade. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have a unique offering where you say, you know, you help women and a few lucky men. <laughs> um, what do you say to the woman out there that doesn't quite have the confidence in herself to, to chase their idea of greatness? Mm, that's a big, that is, that actually hits a lot of women, um, actually. And, and that comes up when I say, okay, live streaming, I'm, I'm, I'm recommending to you, this is one example where I see that fear or that battle of confidence come up. I want you to do live streaming. It's like, I don't like how I sound or I don't like how I look or the dog is going to come in or the child is going to cry or my husband's going to scream from the kitchen or, and so all of these kind of, um, these, these things that are, that cause hesitation, um, we have to kind of look at, is that, is that related to confidence? Is that really, is that fear really? And so what I say um, to every woman is that um, people are very forgiving on social media. So it, it is not the, you don't have to be dolled up. You don't have to be whatever. People are very forgiving. So that's the first thing. If you are holding all of these high expectations on yourself. The second thing is, is that your audience wants to see you. So if you think about it that way, they want to hear from you. They want, they're waiting for you they are they are sitting on the edge of their seat waiting to see your content so if you if you can think about it in that way that is helpful and then the last thing i say about confidence is that you don't need a hundred percent confidence most people sit back and say wow that he's confident man i wish i had his confidence and they just assume that great people or people they feel that have gotten further along have a hundred percent confidence Right. Most people don't. Most people have confidence in certain areas in life and then, you know, some other areas we're working on. But if you could get to at least 51 percent confidence, you could still operate with 49 percent fear. But if you can get a little bit more confidence and fear, that is enough for you to step out. So that's what I would say to the woman who's dealing with either confidence or fear. You just need 51 percent. You can still operate with 49 percent fear. I love it. I absolutely love it. 51% confidence and you can start moving. The other half yeah. to that argument that I hear a lot uh, with, with clients is, but they have a team. Chuck, they got a whole team working with them. They have a, you know, an editor, they have a photographer, they have uh, a social media host, like, and I'm just myself. How do I, and that, and that becomes the new barrier, right? To why they can't do X, Y, Z. What do you say to the, to, to that excuse? 
So what I would say to that is, are you comparing somebody yourself to somebody that's a hundred steps ahead of you? Mm. And if you are, why are you doing that? So somebody that's in the same place as you, I bet does not have that full team um, that's there. And if they do, they're not full-time people. They're contractors that they pulled a couple hours from. So the, the first thing that I would say to that person saying, oh, this, this person has a team, you're probably comparing yourself to someone that's way like several, like a hundred steps ahead of you. And that's not, that's not the, the fair comparison for yourself. Um, and we all know the, the, the great quote comparison is a thief of joy. It assassinates yeah. your joy. Um, so, so that's what I would say, but with that said, if there is support that you need, um, get a virtual assistant, get a social media manager, and they don't have to be full-time staff. They could be five hours a month. Mm. So even if to help you build that, um, that leadership thought process, you could pay for somebody for five hours a month. Yes. So start somewhere if you're feeling like, I don't have a team and I don't have support. Um, you can get support five hours a month, start there. And then don't compare yourself to someone that's a hundred, you know, yards down the road. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. As So as someone that spends so much time helping others and investing into others and building their businesses, how does Charvette recharge? How do you pour back into yourself personally and professionally? Yeah. So I'm an ambivert which um, is a mix between introvert and extrovert. So yeah. I don't know if you've heard of that. And that is a real thing, listeners, if you were to look it up. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you can Google it. So um, I am, so most people think I'm extrovert. Like, oh, you're just out, oh, you're networking all the time, you're blah, blah, blah. But I actually recharge with like quiet time. So I do actually spend a lot of time, um, quiet time, um, you know, just, just here in Richmond. Um, and I keep a core set of friends. Okay. So I have like, uh, you know, I'd say a five and under like core set of friends who I can, you know, let my hair down and just be Charvette. Um, and then they pour into me just in their own, you know, just their friendship. Yeah. you know, pours into me. Um, and so those are things um, I, I will have. I do have a guilty confession um, uh -oh. that I like TikTok. So TikTok is a, I know it's oh, a, no. <laughs> a TikTok or your listeners can relate, but you can, yes. you know, that's a little bit of a guilty pleasure when I'm like, I just want to laugh at somebody else <laughs> and laugh with them. Let me say yes. that. Yes. Um, so TikTok is a guilty pleasure. Okay. Okay. I, I'm not mad at that. I think mine is, yes, I said this on a recent episode. Mine is, I have this little weird, uh, I had Erica Tyson on who is uh, a leadership therapist, which is like one of the best occupations I think anybody can ever have. And I said, I play wow. this little stupid game on my phone. Like it's like a war clash of clans game or whatever the case is. Right. And I play that on my phone and she's like, Chuck, maybe it's not stupid. Maybe it just helps you relax. And yeah. like, yeah, because I don't have to think of nothing but just blowing up this other castle. Like, yes, yeah. <laughs> right, so I right. totally get it. I totally get it. Um, professionally, are you a reader? Are you someone that is consistently looking for what's next? Uh, being that you've had the radio show for so long that, you know, we were, we, we launched back when Blogspot was a thing, right? So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and I still use Blog Talk Radio. Like, oh I, my still God. Still I didn't even know it was still there. Yes, blog talk. That is like my distribution. I go live virtually, but I load the audio in Blog Talk Radio, and they're still my distribution to iTunes and Stitcher and all those places. I did not know they were doing that. I yes. went straight to yeah. We're gonna have to talk about that offline. <laughs> I did not know. Um, but what do you do in terms of professionally? Like, do you, are you a reader? Are you someone that listens to audio books? How do you how do you go yeah, there? Yeah, all of that probably three things. So I do listen to podcasts. Okay. Um, so there are some podcasts that I that I check out consistently every week. Sure. Um, I also um do read. I just ordered um Kiara Shear's latest book. I have um Lovey's late the professional troublemaker troublemaker her latest book. I just ordered Tiffany the Benjanista's latest book and Bishop Jake's latest book about the mic okay. is all don't drop the mic. So yes, so I do um read and then I also you know as a coach or as a a mentor as a strategist I also look for that for myself yes. so you know I enroll in programs um, coaching programs that will help pour into me um, to just keep and they also kind of keep myself on like what's on the cutting edge what's out there what's working yeah I, to that point we we've seen the clubhouse craze come and go right as a podcaster as someone that does interviews I'm kind of on the fence about you know talking on another platform for free 
Um, mm-hmm. But what do you think about the clubhouse versus the Twitter spaces and where that realm of audio is going for people like us that like to do interviews and talk and speak? What do you think about those type of platforms? Um, so I think it's good for those of us that like to talk. Um, my, my hesitation with Clubhouse is that I am a person of, I know the power of, of the replay. I know the power of you going live, that's a certain percentage of your audience, but probably 75% of your audience is, is, kept, is going to catch this when they want to at their leisure. Right. And so what I don't like currently at, at the time of this retaping, I don't <laughs> like that it's it's almost the away content, like that it disappears. Right. And, and so I have shot away from actually hosting a lot of houses because I'm just of rooms, I should say, because I'm just, I just don't like that my content disappears. disappears um, yeah. Now, with that said, I have been guest on a couple, you know, couple stages, but I actually, I listen more for just development. I'll listen to some of the relationship shows. I'll listen to some of that. Uh, and so um, I think it's interesting. I don't think it is going anywhere. A matter of fact, uh, Facebook released, and I posted this on Twitter, Facebook released um, this week that they are basically going to have a competitor. They're going to have rooms, basically oh, wow. audio rooms available. They're going to have a podcast option available and quick, um, they're calling it sound bites with audio. So audio, that's good for you and I, because we're yes. used to audio. What I, what I like about Facebook is I feel like it won't it will be content. I'm looking to see how they're going to handle it and if it will be content that disappears or if it'll stay around. But um, audio, I think, is here to stay. And if you're a podcast or a speaker, you're positioned well to leverage it. My only issue with Clubhouse is that it disappears. Um, yes. So, so that, that leads me to my next question because a lot of business coaches will, will stress the, the go live on Instagram, right? They'll say, you have to go live. You have to go live. You have to go live. And my thing is similar to what you just said. I love going live. I don't do it as much as I probably should even. Um, But for the same reason, I know what happens when I Google people's names in Spotify and Apple podcasts. And and I go to look for these people that are supposed to be industry leaders and their, their, their name to me, this is how I equate it. Your name and your work dies, right? Because you're, you're not searchable on a legacy platform which is, you know, we know Apple Podcasts ain't going nowhere. We know Spotify is not going anywhere, even Pandora. And so I am, I, you know, like you, I understand the power of the replay. People will, once they discover you, they go binge, right? They go binge listen. And so your, your, your podcast or your interview or your episode that's a year old, you know, six months from now gets 3000 views because now it's being discovered. And and so what do you say to that when, you know, some coaches say go live and I understand it because you're addressing part of the, you know, part of the audience, but the rest of your audience is at work, right? They dropping off kids. They can't catch that. But they, it stays around. So that, that content stays around. So if you're doing Facebook, um, it's similar to a podcast in the sense of the content does not disappear. Okay. So that is the difference. So that Instagram live will stay on your page. The Facebook live will stay on your page. Yes. You can say, and so, yes. So yes, you can save it and it can be a part of your profile. Yeah. Some people, I guess, delete it if they don't want it, but you can keep it a part of your profile. Um, and so the main thing around the live piece is that giving your audience a two-way communication, um, if you can, if you can, I think what's interesting is the Twitter, um, what is interesting for people around Clubhouse and even now Twitter has this rooms feature for, yeah. it looks like for yeah. select people is the two-way communication. So I feel like people are drawn to that and perhaps why the live video kind of was a thing because it felt kind of two-way um, yeah. or, or it felt instant. Like if you're on a live stream and you see somebody com- somebody's comment or question, you can respond. Now with these rooms, you're actually jumping up and talking to the person. So I think that's appealing for people. So I would say you wanna be where your audience is and you wanna leverage on that platform what's getting the most attention. And so if we talk about Instagram, Instagram Reels is getting the most attention, probably in my opinion, more than lives. So I would actually push you to do Reels. Facebook, Facebook Stories are getting a lot of attention. Facebook Live is still getting a lot of attention. So whereas if you're on LinkedIn, it might be an article or your article post might be getting more attention. So you want to look at where your audience is hanging out, where you're hanging out and what's getting the most attention at that point. And it's been, it shifts some. So you got to kind of check in on it. Do you, do you, 
suggest that people try to build out all of those platforms at the same time, right? So if you have this Planoly feature, you can go, you can post this to Facebook, you can post this to LinkedIn, this to Instagram. How does it work? Should each platform get different content, I guess is the question. All right. And actually heard two questions in that. So I'm gonna deal with the first one that I think I heard. Um, so I recommend, I do not recommend to clients that they have to be in like 50, 59, 11 places. Um, <laughs> so okay. pick two platforms where your clients are, are just key um, and go hard in the paint on those two, roughly two platforms. And you could even do one, but go hard in the paint on those two platforms. Um, and you can duplicate content over. So I'm, I, because a a lot of times on Instagram, even if you have some of the same people following you, they may just see it on Instagram quicker than the Facebook because the Facebook algorithm is funny or, or what have you. So I don't I don't feel like you have to have separate content. If I create a 20 second vertical uh, video, guess what? That's getting posted on Instagram stories, Instagram reels, Twitter, um, Twitter fleek. Uh, LinkedIn story, Facebook story, Facebook business page story. So that one piece of content is going in seven places. Love so it. I'm a proponent of, of spreading the content around. I don't feel like you have to have separate content all of the time. Got it. Got it. So like, like myself, you've interviewed tons of heavy hitters and rock stars and you know, dignitaries, kings, queens, all that good stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you think is, what do you think top producers have in common personality wise? Mm, we establish rapport easily um, and we can flow easily. We can, you know, we can flow off the, you know, unprepared in a sense. Some people are very good if they have written out, everything is written out. Um, like I'll take news, news, people that work, you know, on, on traditional TV news reporters, they're reading everything they're saying, like they're reading, but sometimes you pull those people out and have them like MC an event that doesn't have all the details and they're kind of like lost in the sauce. So I feel like producers like us, we know how to operate on the fly, if you will, where things aren't all scripted out and we establish rapport um, easily. So, yeah. Nice. I like it. I didn't think about it like that because it's, it's someone asked me recently as we were, you know, looking to confirm a date for their interview. Um, they asked me, do you typically give out questions before the interview? And the word that I caught was typically. And so uh -huh. for myself, I was like, that means I have a choice. Absolutely not. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I don't <laughs> give out the questions, but the reason that I do that, and I will if they need them, right? But the reason that I do that is I feel like if you are who you say you are and who the research, you know, presents you to be, you should be able to talk for an hour about your industry and about your experiences, right? Am I, am I expecting too much by not doing I would say for someone that's been in the game for a while, I would say for newer people, um, preparation probably does help them a little bit, but I'm the same way. I don't automatically send out questions. Yeah. If someone asks and says, do you have some prep questions? I will send about eight to 10 of like, these are the types, the direction I probably, I may go in. Right. Um, and so I, but I only do that. It's like upon request. Um, and, you know, I'm not spending like a ton of time in it, but I, and I've actually had um, people who I felt were like really had been on really major stages. Yes. Um, I mean, ABC, NBC, and they asked their assistant asked for prep questions. So yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, that made me think of, I had someone on the show that um, the episode actually never aired because similar, I thought that they were an absolute rock star. They've been everywhere, right? And yeah. um, live like this, they couldn't, it was just, they were lost. And it was, I found myself having to not only carry the conversation, but help prompt them to answer some of the questions and I was just like, okay, is this really what you do? Or are you someone that's used to having a script, which is fine, but yep. you know, be, be, be humble enough to be able to ask, right? Like if, if yeah. that's what you needed, be able to ask. And I think that some people operate in this, um, this realm where they feel like their audience should either know or back to what we talked about confidence, right? They aren't confident enough to admit that they may need an outline. Absolutely. I've seen that and I wrap those interviews up. Quicker, <laughs> you know, 
they they don't they don't last the full the full forty. No, <laughs> I saw the face. It's like pulling teeth. It's like pulling teeth. So you know, you go ahead and do what you do, and then wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I do. I'm not you know different people do different things. Absolutely. <laughs> So as, as, as you've built this brand and this business, what's the thing that you wish you would have learned or, or could have learned earlier to shorten your learning curve? Mm, I would earlier, I would have gotten, um, some coaching, some, some more one-on-one coaching okay. with a, a strategist okay. higher than me. I would have done that sooner. Okay. Um, and I also would have been more forceful around building my email list sooner. Mm, so okay. I had one, but I, it, when I look at the timeline, I, it was probably five years uh, into the game before I focused on an email list. So it was kind of like, wow, you know, all that, those five years of contacts, you know, right. could have been building. So, yeah. Building the email list sooner and getting, um, you know, working with a consultant or a coach sooner. Okay. I like it. I like it. So, Ooh, that, that, so that gives me a whole nother question because <laughs> people will look at Charvette Mitchell and they will say, what do you mean? She has a coach? Like she's yes. been doing it. Like, so how, when did that become a realization that you would hire someone to teach you how to be even better? Because I'll be honest, you look at the, you look at the resume and you know, you are what most people aspire to get to. Right. So when did you realize that you needed a coach and how was that process, you know, in, in terms of thought processes? There is someone that is always further along than you. <laughs> and so and, and so what happens is when you can work with someone that's even a hundred, even 20 yards ahead, a hundred yards ahead, 20, 300 yards ahead, um, they give they can give you the escape routes and, and cut through some of the minutiae that you are trying to figure out. Yeah. So I am no, I am not at the Oprah level. I'm not at, you know, there's not so. <laughs> You know, I, I, I work with people who are, you know, several, several, several multiple six figures. And then the person I'm looking at now is seven figures in a million. So you, you work with, you are, there's someone always ahead of you, no matter where, where you are. I bet uh, Oprah looked at Maya Angelou as a mentor, if yes. you will, as a coach. So there's always room for, and even if it's not a coaching situation, even if it is other like-minded people that you can bounce ideas off. Hey, I ran this launch. Did you have this thing? What did you do when you ran into this? So even if it is a forum or a way for you to have to bounce ideas off of someone that even is in the same similar circle, but I guarantee you there are people further ahead. And when you get in rooms with people that are further ahead, even I remember being in a scenario where I was kind of, I was in a, in a mastermind and sharing my pricing and the ladies were like, you are way priced too low. And I would not have had that exposure if there weren't other people saying, no, this is what people pay in the industry for what you're, what, for your, what you're offering. Wow. And that didn't come about until I stepped up, got into a paid program and mentorship and was able to network with people who were several, several, you know, ahead of me and saying, oh, oh no, sister, you got to update. <laughs> yeah. So it's exposed. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a big, um, conversation around charging more for your services right now and i um personally i'm on i'm on the fence on it right because i feel like it depends on who you're trying to help because right now everybody's an expert right and the thing about everybody being an expert is that now nobody knows who to trust so true you know and so, so when when you um, are looking at your newer clients and they're having this pricing conversation with you um, and their brand isn't household, right? They're not the golden arches. They're not even McDowell's yet, right? From coming to right. America. <laughs> um, how do you approach that conversation when, yes, they should charge more so that you have to do less, but let's not act like the dollar store isn't a Fortune 500 company. You know what I mean? Sure, like, sure. So how do you, how do you do that? So I look at where they already are and I, I have some great examples. So I have a, a client, Maria, who, when she came to me, a therapist, so all, did her, her own practice as a therapist, and she started an organization that is around autism, autism in black. Okay. And her, her number one, her people trying to meet with her one-on-one was packed jam full the 
all like she had no openings. That's the first indication your price is too low. But when you look at what she was, when I looked at what she was charging up against all she was doing and what she brought to the table as a therapist, meeting with the schools, doing all that. And it was like $50. It was something her husband even said, you might as well just do this for free. It was like oh, something wow. like something <laughs> so low. It was like $50, but all of this work she was doing and all of this expertise she brings to the table, that's someone where we like triple her price and her, her audience pays it. So it's not just willy nilly, but again, what did she bring to the table? Another client that was an accountant that was charging something crazy, like $25. Like you are a certified public accountant. You got X amount of years in the, in the government industry. You already have years as an entrepreneur but in that mindset of, well, I want to help people, but look at all of the work that you're doing around it. So it's not, I don't have clients just say, oh, you just, you need to charge a thousand dollars an hour. No, I'm looking at, and then there might be another client who I might say, okay, a um, hundred dollars yeah. versus this, these clients, I might say, you need, you're close to 350 an hour. So it's really around what have they already done? What credentials do they already have? And what are they doing? What's all the stuff they're bringing to the table? Right. And if they're already in demand. Because the demand that in that one instance, Maria, literally, she didn't even have her link on her website. She took the link down because she was booked up and she stayed booked up. Yeah. So her, she's, she's only one person. That's a demand. So now we got to curb the demand because now they recognize she brings so much to the table. Yeah. So it's really an individual conversation. But I look at what they already bring to the table and what they are doing. I'm so glad that you expounded on that because... Like I said, in, 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 in this realm, you know, we watch the Instagram lives or reels or whatever, and everybody's saying, I started making more money because I raised my prices. Well, you also had a built-in fan base. You also had a brand that was yeah. recognizable, right? And so I feel like we do a disservice by telling new entrepreneurs uh, to start off with these absorbent prices when they don't have a proof of concept or a proof of uh, demand right. yet. I agree. I agree with you. And, and so I definitely am looking at what is what's all the stuff that you need to bring to the table. Now, there are some clients who I know right now, if I told them to raise their prices, their mindset isn't there. So sales is a transfer of confidence. So if you don't and I heard somebody say it on Instagram and I wish I knew who it was because I didn't I don't quote them, but they somebody on Instagram said it. And I love that sales is a transfer of confidence. So if the person doesn't have the confidence to sell at a certain level. It doesn't matter what you tell them to raise their price because they're not going to sell it. At that level so sometimes it's just a little bit of a bump up um but there are clients i could definitely say you know what you really could be charging more but let's take this little step here because they need to raise their confidence around it but, the, but yeah the internet is a, a blessing and a cursing in that sense um because you can be anything you want to be and you can be anything you want <laughs> you literally you could be anything you want to be I, I tell people all the time that it, the hard part about the internet is that people forget that they're in the people business, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of, as much money as you can make online and courses and, uh, you know, your link tree and go here and all that good stuff. I am, maybe because I'm an old school dude, but I know that there's more money made offline. There's more deals made offline. And so I think that people forget how important people skills are. Do you... Yeah do any work with people around, you know, how to win friends and influence people, you know, Dale Carnegie's old book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, even though I focus a lot on online, when I, in that part of the framework with events, that's really offline. Like when that, before COVID, that was get out, network, go to meet up. So that was like offline. And then sometimes for some clients, they are doing more business offline. And so their online presence is just if somebody comes and checks, somebody mm -hmm. comes to, well, you're, you're meeting, you got a contract that somebody slid across the table, they're going to come look you up. So right. then in that case, the influence is, and if they look you up wherever, are you credible? Do you do you have information and content out there and interviews that support that you do what you do? Um, but yeah, the influence can be online and offline. Um, and I'm, I'm big about showing your face uh, on social, um, but also emails are a part of it. You know, that content marketing is all a part of the influence. But the, the event portion of the Platform Builder Framework be prior to COVID was all about like getting out there 
going to other people's events, um, offering to speak, MC, bend, or just going to other people's events or hosting your own events and that person to person um, thing. And that is one of the best decisions I made. I got to tell you, I've hosted, I'm going into my sixth year of my conference that I host annually. And that hands down was one of the best decisions, business decisions I made ever. Wow. Wow. I, um, I remember having Amber Aziza uh, on the show and you know, Amber's a rock star and she killed it. And one of the things that she, that stuck with me is she said, if you can't talk for 24 hours, don't consider yourself an expert. Um, Mm -hmm. So that leads my next question and we're getting close to wrapping up, but that leads me to this question. When did you know that you were qualified to help other people? confidence wise, not skill wise, confidence wise. When I saw other people getting results. So if I gave them a strategy, a technique, and they went and did it and they got results or it made them position for results, that's raised my confidence. Love it. Love it. Uh, Getting close to wrapping up. We have entered the rapid fire section. I need my little air horns. Um, Uh (laughs) So I'm going to give you a couple of words. You tell me what these words mean to you. Um, the first word would be belief. Mm, I think about God and I'm a faith-based entrepreneur. Yes. And so I believe that um, I'm set up for a success because I'm faith-based. Okay. Uh, second word would be vision. What does the word vision mean? Mm, to where are we going? Where are we going? And what do we see? Um, so that's what I think about. Where am I going? And what do I see when I get there? Okay. Uh, third word would be hustle hustle um i don't adapt to hustle um so um i think of hustle as like it's your struggle it feels like a struggle word to me um so that's what i think when i hear people say hustle i feel like it's a struggle word i like that nobody has ever i think you're the first person even when i had the hustle harder success you know way back in the day nobody ever um, and I think we've both evolved since then, obviously, but nobody's yeah. ever put the two and two together to correlate that hustle means that you're operating from a, a lack of, right? Yeah. So I like that yeah. you put that, that part together. Um, the next word that I have is a compound word for those English majors, uh, but imposter <laughs> syndrome. Ah, um, feeling, uh, it's a lie. <laughs> um, that's the first thing I think about. Um, it's a lie, but it feels real to okay. a lot of people. And so um, you're always you're combating imposter syndrome with reminding yourself of what you have already done. Mm, nice. Mm-hmm. This is the first time someone has ever heard of Charvette Mitchell. You're in a room and you're talking to 5,000 people and it's being simulcast across 34 countries. Once it be once it's released, it will be. Um, what do you want them to know about Charvette, the woman, and Charvette, the business owner? Listen, I'm Charvette Mitchell, and I'm your online strategist and marketing specialist, and I'm here to help you build your online platform and personal brand so that you generate more revenue and put more cash in your pocket. I am your overwhelm eliminator, your social media superstar, and your straight talking strategist. I love it. And what about the woman, the air fryer versus the crock pot? What, <laughs> what chill, keeps Charvette sassy. going? <laughs> the Charvette, the woman, chill, sassy, smart, uh, a little goofy. That's who I am. <laughs> I don't think anybody would believe that you're goofy at all. I just, a little. I said a little. If you look little. at my Instagram reels and Facebook stories, you might feel that way. <laughs> I watched one. You know what's funny is I watched not too long ago. You were doing, um, I don't remember. It was a product. A day in the Life? Maybe. It in but life? It, was, it was the one. And all I remember you saying after you did the little makeup thing is like, we don't waste no pretty. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that was yesterday. Yeah. We don't waste the pretty. <laughs> I love it. I, lo- I thought that was so funny because my I have a nine year old and she's pretty much her my, my nine year old and my fourteen year old are literally uh-huh. the exact same. They're like, Dad, if we're not leaving this house, I'm not doing nothing. But if we leave in the house, <laughs> I need two hours notice because right, right, we need notice. We yeah, need notice. They, and and they'll just jump in the car. Let's go. You know, I can throw right. on a shirt and move. They are not having, it. not having. Yeah. It. 
Um, let everybody know where they can find Charvette Mitchell online. All right, easy place, charvettemitchell.com. We'll take you to my main website and all of my social media links are there. Getting to the show, um, I invite you to do a, a meet and greet call if anything I've said connects you, uh, connects with you. If you're like, hey, I want to, uh, I'm a female entrepreneur that's service-based. I want to work with her about elevating my brand. Um, you can have a complimentary meeting and greet call and charvettemitchell.com uh, is where you can get to everything. And um, most places online, I'm Charvette, other than Instagram, I'm Charvette M. Awesome, awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been rocking with the one and only world's greatest superstar, Charvette Mitchell. She is changing lives, creating a living resume of success. And I um, am so happy to have had you on the show. Thank you so much for jumping on. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Guys, visionaries, listen, click, like, share, subscribe. Most importantly, share this with other visionaries just like yourself. You know what they say. Actually, what I always say, there is no such thing as a miracle that has happened without somebody doing the work. So get lost in it. We'll either see you at the top or from the top. It's Chuck Hawkins, Hawk Vision Podcast. Thank you, Charvette. Thank you.